So we see her sitting at his feet listening in John chapter 10. And then in John chapter 11, we see her weeping at his feet because her brother died. And she says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And then in John chapter 12, again, she's at his feet, but this time to pour expensive perfume on his feet. So always Mary at the feet of Jesus. I want in on that. I don't know about you, but that's a better choice <laughs> to be in at the feet of Jesus in whatever posture is appropriate for that moment. So here's what the verse that I'll, I'll kind of pivot on. It says in John 11, 33, in the voice version, when Jesus saw Mary's profound grief and the moaning and weeping of her companions, he was deeply moved by their pain in his spirit and was intensely troubled. Jesus says, where have you laid his body? The Jewish people said, come and see, Lord. And as they walked, Jesus wept. And I know that's considered the shortest version in the Bible. People joke, I read my Bible, Jesus wept, I got my check the box, I read my Bible. But boy, I'll tell you what, it's profound. Amen. Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. <laughs> right? Like, he was with the Father when Adam and Eve were in the garden and, and committed the first sin. He was with the Father before the creation of the world for all time. And yet he's in Bethany crying. And it made me just really dig down and say, Lord, I don't fully understand how much love and compassion that you have for us. That in every way you were tempted just like we are, yet without sin. But that doesn't mean you were a robot. He had emotions. He loves us like we were singing today. And he knows everything about us. And Chris Tomlin has this wonderful verse in one of his songs, Indescribable. You see the depths of my heart, and you love me the same. Yeah. You are amazing, God. I'm like, whoa. There's no conditional love with God. How much of a mess we make doesn't give us a right to make a mess that he'll forgive us because we end up loving him so much we don't want to do the thing that would displease him. And that's motivation out of love instead of motivation out of fear or punishment, right? So Jesus is weeping on the way to the tomb of Lazarus. And I just want to unpack that a little bit. I already quoted that was from John 8, 58. Truly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And Abraham is mentioned often in the New Testament. I like Romans 4. It says, who against hope believed in hope. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? Yeah. Who against hope believed in hope. How many know what that feels like? Amen. That it's not looking too good. You feel like the lobster at the restaurant in the fish tank. You know this? They're like looking at each other and they're like, man, it's not looking too good for us, guys. Like, I don't know how we're getting out of here. Ever feel that way? Now I gave you a new picture of what that feels like. <laughs> and then this one, I never forgot this from when I was newly saved reading the King James Bible. Romans 4, 20 says, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. That's a mouthful right there. Unbelief could cause us to stagger at God's promises. I remember playing football when I was a sophomore. I was playing middle linebacker on our team, and I was still learning the ways of the varsity because I was used to the freshman team. And we were in practice, and we were told to go all out in practice. And our team had been state champs just a year before that. So there was a lot of big dudes. I was tall but not quite filled out yet. And I was playing middle linebacker. Actually, I was playing center that time. And there was an interception. And if it was a game and the ball gets intercepted, if you're the center, you try to go tackle that guy. And um, you know how when you're like partway into something, you know you made a mistake, but it's too late to stop? <laughs> because I saw the two guys, one had intercepted the ball, and they were going through the motions. Even though it was practice, they intercepted the pass. And this is what you do in the game. <laughs> And I could see the gleam in their eye when they saw I was dumb enough to try to come and tackle them. And they buried me. Like, literally, I had to get peeled out of the turf. <laughs> I was staggering when I stood up. But good old Italian hard head, I'm still here, right? <laughs> but you learn those lessons. And unbelief can cause you to stagger. You lose the courage to take that step. A friend of ours sent us a video of tribesmen in Africa, and they had 
they had perfected a technique of getting game meat from the lions. They would follow the lions. The lions would make a kill, and these guys had perfected the method of walking right up to the lions. There was four of them. They walk right up with their swords, and the lions back off. They cut the meat up, and then they walk out, and the lions are looking like, what just happened? We did all the work. We could eat those guys. But there's something, I could send you this if you want, if you don't, I should have had it, I guess, but yeah, amazing. It's all because of the way they moved. It was the confidence that they had that even the lions easily could have taken them out. And that just speaks to not staggering through unbelief. When you know God spoke to you, that's what Bishop Hammond, Jane Hammond, all, all the prophetic people that we're connected with, that's the number one thing, is to know you hear from God. And if you know you hear from God, you're confident regardless of feeling like the lobster at the supermarket. <laughs> you're still getting out of there. So Abraham was strong in faith giving glory to God and being, come on, fully persuaded that what God had promised, he was able to also perform. And then Romans 11, Paul just gets overwhelmed and he says, oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. Anybody ever felt that way when you're reading the Bible and you just keep going deeper and deeper and it's like, this never ends. The more I read, the more revelation he gives me. And I think that's a never ending process for the rest of our lives. And, and God says, he, uh, the, the Bible says in the Old Testament that God hides it and then it's the king's privilege to go find it, to go dig for that revelation. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For of him and through him and to him are, come on, come on, you got to help me out here, are some things. See how it loses a little bit if you say some? No, for from him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be the glory forever, amen. And then Colossians says, he has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love. How many got, got the picture from the kingdom of darkness? You know what that was like. Because some of you probably, you know, you didn't live there first. You've just been Christians your whole life. But, huh. He chased me down into that pit of darkness and he found me. Don't even want to tell you the horrible things I did, but nothing you do separates you from the love of God. <laughs> oh my God. He delivered me from that power of darkness and conveyed me into his kingdom, the kingdom of the son of his love in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. He's the image of the invisible God. Jesus is the image of the invisible God, and he's weeping on a hill in Bethany. Human and God knows everything about us, is touched with our weaknesses, firstborn over all creation. For by him all things are created that are in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. This is amazing language. He walked among us. And yet, he's the author of the universe. The exact image of the invisible God we have in Jesus. He is before all things, and in him all things consist. He's the head of the body, the church, He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. So that's what we'll celebrate next week, right? The firstborn from the dead. Because, you know, God took some dirt. He made Adam. Out of Adam came Eve. They came back together. They were re reunited, right? So that's the picture that man and women together, the image of God, created he, male and female, right? So no confusion about what God thinks of marriage. That's, that's an easy one. So... We create life, the devil can't, so the devil tries to take us out so we won't create more images of God. <laughs> He's not going to win. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, the first one that resurrected. They were fine in the garden until they sinned. There was no death. And remember, the devil tricked them and said, you won't die if you eat from that tree. And they didn't immediately die. So it might look like he was right, but they brought death into the garden. So the first Adam sinned, the second Adam, Jesus came and reversed the curse of the sin. 
And through his resurrection next week, the Holy Spirit is released. And now we are the tabernacle, the temple of Holy Spirit. Holy and unholy trying to combine and being in contention with each other. And the more we crucify that old nature and that flesh, which could sound like works mentality, but look, if you want to flourish in God, do it the Spirit's way, not your flesh's way. Right. Right? He's the firstborn from the dead. That in all things he may have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. And by him reconcile all things to himself. By him whether things on earth or things in heaven. Having made peace through the blood of his cross. Again that's a setup for next week. But I think it ties in with this trip that he's taking through Bethany. Is that the creator of the universe loves us enough to dwell with us knows everything about us. You see the depths of my heart and you love me the same. You are amazing, God. Indescribable yeah. is the title of that song. So I just felt like he was giving me perspective on what happened with Lazarus was a foretelling of the, of the resurrection because it was the week right before Jesus dies, right? That's, that's when they're at the house. It's right before Passover the following Friday is when Jesus is at the house and, and Lazarus is resurrected. And, and it would be like Jesus to do that, to give us an image in the natural of what was going to take place in the supernatural, right? And let's see if that, if, that, if that bears witness with you. So we go back to John 11, 1. I, I already told you that in John 10 is when Jesus said, Mary has made the better choice to sit at my feet and Martha was in the kitchen. So now we see in 11, in the village of Bethany, there was a man named Lazarus and his sisters, Mary and Martha. Mary was the one who would anoint Jesus' feet with costly perfume and dry his feet with her hair. Isn't that great that John would want to point that out to us? How many know that's extravagant worship of the Lord? She took something that Judas looked at and said, oh, what a waste. And she said, no, I'm going to pour out my best for the Lord. And, and it was a symbolic thing, right? We know that we'll get there, but... John felt it necessary to say, you know, that was an all-star on our team. Mary was an all-star. She was sitting at his feet in the kitchen, even, I'm sorry, when Martha was in the kitchen. And part of why Martha was upset is my conjecture, but it's backed by some good theology. Part of why Martha was upset that Mary was in the kitchen is because women weren't supposed to be in with the men. Women weren't allowed to learn how to, how to read and write, and here Jesus is letting her sit in right with the rest of the guys. And nobody else, amen, nobody else had the revelation to be written about, talked about 2,000 years later. There's no man that brought costly perfume and put it on the feet of Jesus. But this woman sure knew what it was like to do extravagant worship. Do you think it was a waste for her to pour that oil? Mm -mm. Not a waste, not in the kingdom economy. There's a different economy than, the, than earth, and we'll get there. But he points it out. So his sister sent a message to Jesus because Lazarus got really sick. They said, Lord, our brother Lazarus, the one you love, is very sick. Please come. And when he heard this, he said, this sickness will not end in death for Lazarus, but will bring glory and praise to God. This will reveal the greatness of the Son of God by what takes place. And I wondered about why he waited, and I'm sure, you know, we've all read different things, and I don't know that, you know, I've learned, I've been a Christian almost 40 years now, and things that I knew to be true my first year, it's not that they weren't true. The Lord has just unpacked some more additional revelation, right? And, and that's, you, know, you hope that never changes. You don't, you don't err from the true north compass, but he shows you more degrees and, and different dimensions of the same truth. Okay, I hope that doesn't sound like a heretic, but... This is one of them. What, why did he wait? And, you know, I'll just tell you what I felt like he showed me this, this time, week as I was studying. He said, this will bring praise to glo bring glory. Let's just read it again. The sickness will not end in death for Lazarus, even though he would die, but it won't end in death for Lazarus, but it will bring glory and praise to God. This will reveal the greatness of the Son of God by what takes place. All right, then you jump to verse 21, and Jesus arrives there, and Martha's the first one to come out and meet him, it, uh, and John goes to the detail of telling us that Mary waited behind. 
which lets you know that she's really disappointed and, and just grieving over the loss. Martha runs out to meet him. That's fine. That's good. Mary was just a little bit more heartbroken, I would say. So she says, my Lord, if only you had come sooner, my brother wouldn't have died. But I know if you were to ask God even now, anything, he would do it for you. Jesus told her, your brother will rise and live. <laughs> and you know the next part. I'm sure you know this. Yes, she said, he will rise with everyone else on resurrection day. Martha, Jesus said, you don't have to wait until then. I am the resurrection. <laughs> And I am the eternal, the life eternal. Anyone who clings to me in faith, even though he dies, will live forever. Yeah. I mean, I'll tell you, this is a couple weeks worth of teaching. We'll unpack it as time goes by. But, you know, Martha represents that part of our life that has to function and has to go on and doesn't always get the deep amount of time that we think we need. Half the time, I would say, the things we're busy about are not nearly as important as the things we would be getting in prayer if we would just take the time to pray. <laughs> and then in verse 26 it says, And the one who lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? And she says yes. And then Martha, I'm sorry, Mary beats him in verse 32. When Mary finally found Jesus outside the village, she fell at his feet in tears. Remember, she was at his feet in the living room. Now she's fallen at his feet in tears. And said, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have died. Right now, it's the same thing that Martha said. They had faith to believe for that miracle. When Jesus looked at Mary and saw her weeping at his feet and all her friends who were with her grieving, he shuddered with emotion and was deeply moved with tenderness and compassion. I don't know about you. I just wasn't given that picture of God when I was growing up in a denominational worldview. He was an angry God. He wasn't a loving father that had his arms out ready for me to jump in his lap. It was more like, you know, when, it, when you get a call from your boss, the first thing you think of is you're in trouble. Yeah. Right? And that's how corporate America works anyway. Like, they never call you when good things are happening. So if they're calling, you just, like, the default setting is, uh-oh, I'm in trouble. Not that way. Let me just say, if you get nothing else out of today, understand that is not the heart of our Father God. He loves us. He's a good, good Father. That's who you are. <laughs> and he doesn't want bad things to happen to you. You heard what Keith said. I know the thoughts and plans I have for you, says the Lord. Not to punish you. Right. Punishment is like torture and torment. The, the problem of not obeying God is on us, not him. He, his heart's broken when we disobey him because we're the ones that suffer through lack of obedience. You obey, you get blessed, you disobey, you just open yourself up to curses. It's not that God's punishing you. You've walked out from underneath the blessing. Hmm. So he's really moved. Like he, was felt, he felt the emotions, and I've heard so many different messages over the year about why Jesus wept, and I'm not going through that whole list, but I'll just tell you that here he is, the creator of the whole universe, and I believe that even when he was back with the Father, when Adam and Eve were in the garden before they sinned, and they were having this perfect relationship with God, but when they sinned, I believe Jesus was grieving at that moment. He was weeping like, oh, and it wasn't because he knew he had to come and fix it, all right? There was no selfishness in the Lord. It was because he knew that when we stray from the way God gives us, we end up in a mess. How many know that's true? Come on, you know it's true. And, and somehow it has a bigger grip on us than the grip of the Lord on us. So we wanted to say, loose that grip of the enemy. You don't have any place in my life. I give you no place, and I'm going to completely dedicate myself to serving the Lord. And he's deeply moved with tenderness and compassion when he sees Mary. Now, Martha was also upset, but there's something about the relationship with Jesus and Mary that... It says that he loved her, not in, in a sexual way, but he's identifying with humanity. And he found a searcher after God. He found somebody that was after his heart, and he rewards that person. That's who we want to be. Mary. It's nothing wrong with Martha. I get Martha, and we need her too. But she can't have preeminence over the Mary side of our heart. And then I read this. Uh, well, actually, I jumped ahead a little. It says in verse 38... When Jesus, who was intensely troubled by all of this, approached the tomb, which was a small cave covered by a massive stone, and he says what? Say it with me. Remove the stone. Don't you love that? 
remove the stone. I have a feeling he was like those African warriors. He just walked up and said, remove the stone, <laughs> boldly. And, and Martha, you know, you would think she'd be the one. She says, oh, Lord, he's been dead for four days. The stench will be unbearable. And when we were in our prior church, there was a ministry to the homeless. We used to send a bus down to Newark because we were in Essex County. It was pretty close by. And we used to bring homeless people into our Sunday service, and they would sit in the back row, and people that walked into the church would have to walk past them. And the pastor of the church would say, I know some of you might be offended that we have people in the back row that haven't bathed recently, but that's why they're here. We want to love them, and we want to give them the love of God. And just so you have an image in your mind, that's how your sin smells to God. <laughs> oh, boy, that was a good one, wasn't it? Ah, don't be pulling the speck out of your brother's eye. <laughs> He's been dead for four days. He's going to stink. And I love this part. Jesus says, remember, I told you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God. 41, they remove the stone. Jesus lifts his eyes towards heaven and says, Father, I'm grateful that you have heard me. Now, what would be the thing about moving the stone away to know that God had answered the prayer? No smell. Right? Like as soon as the stone gets rolled away, they're expecting to get blasted. And there's no smell. Because there's no decomposing body. <laughs> because he's alive. He's been resurrected. It's a picture of what's going to happen one week later to Jesus. Four days in this case, it's going to be three days in that case, and it's going to be an instant and a twinkling of the eye for us. At a moment, at the twinkling of the eye, we're going to hear him. Can't wait for that one. Father, I'm grateful that you heard me. I know that you're delaying. I'm sorry, that you're always listening, but I proclaim it loudly so that everyone here will believe that you have sent me. After these words, he called out in a, don't you love it, in a thunderous voice. We sang that song this morning. Man, I love that song. Open the grave. I'm coming out. I'm going to live. I'm going to live again. That's not some cute little ballad, man. If you're going to sing that song, sing it, right? Open the grave. I'm coming out. And if you've been delivered from addictions, you know what the grave is like because that thing was holding you in a tomb. And then Jesus frees you, and it's like, oh, my God, I'm free. I'm not bound by that thing anymore. But it's not just addiction. It's all forms of sin that, that hold us down and separate us from God. And the power of God breaks that thing so that it can't control you anymore. And his spirit comes in, and the word of God and the spirit mixed together control your life now and lead you to so much better decisions. Somebody better be shouting about that. Oh, my God. When I first got saved, I had so much more money in my pocket because I wasn't drinking anymore. But it's not just that. I wasn't doing the stupid things you do when you're drinking, which is buy rounds for everybody at the bar. I was like, where did all this money come from? Oh, I'm not being an idiot anymore. That's a good one. Thunderous voice. He says, Lazarus, come out. Oh, man, that's such a picture for America today come out. Out came the man who had been dead. That's a line of a song right there. Can't you just picture it? Out came the man who had been dead, his hands and feet tightly wrapped in burial cloths, linen strips, and with a burial cloth wrapped around his face, Jesus said, unwrap him. Can't you just picture it? Like them spinning it off and unraveling him, and he's like twirling like, hallelujah. I'm alive. I didn't like being dead. I like it way better out here in the fresh air. And boy, you live differently after you know that you survived that plane crash, man. Because that's what sin does. It just gets you right to the point of death. And you stare at the abyss. And a lot of us made a deal with God. If you get me out of this one, God, I'll serve you for the rest of my life. He'll take it. He'll take it. He'll take it. He, you know, his address is the end of your rope. That's where he lives. You get to the end of the rope, you found God. He's waiting there with a message from heaven. But unwrap him and release him, I'd say, really, you could say, is a, a, a mission statement for the church. 
It's what we're supposed to do. Not just ourselves. Yes, we certainly need to unwrap the problems that we're dealing with. But when we can, when we can meet people and meet them right where they are, we were with uh, watching Chuck Pierce last night, and he had a guest speaker named Kent Maddox, and he, uh, he talked about how his church in Alabama had gotten religious, and they were focusing so much on just their church meetings. And then all of a sudden, God, through apostolic ministry, said, you need to get out of the four walls of the church and go meet the people in your town. And he goes and meets the mayor, and the mayor asks him to pray for him so that he get filled with the Holy Spirit. The mayor gets filled with the Holy Spirit. After when he first met the guy, the guy said, you know, I know you're charismatic and I'm a Christian, but I don't believe in that stuff that you do. And he must have said it like five times. And Kent said, oh, no, that's okay. And, uh, and then Kent gave him a prophetic word. He didn't say this yesterday at the meeting, but I had heard it prior at another testimony. And, and when the guy was coming outside to his car, Kent Maddox gave him a prophetic word. And the guy said, how did you know that? And Kent Maddox said, because God loves you and he's talking to you through me. That's how he wants all Christians to be, as a conduit, to speak. And the guy said, well, would you pray for me to, to receive the Holy Spirit like the, one, like the way you're talking about it? Wow. And he does. Ten minutes later, Kent gets a call and says, what did you do to me? <laughs> he says, I, I got out of my car on my destination, and I started talking like a Navajo Indian. <laughs> Jehovah Sneaky, man, I'll tell you what. Wouldn't it be awesome like, if we could just be so contagious with the love of God that instead of judging people and telling them what they already know that they're in sin, they already know that they're in sin. They're just hoping that God isn't watching. Hope he's got his mind on somebody else. I'll sneak in. Unwrap him and release him. Man, we could really stop here, but I'm not just going to go a little bit further. So this is a problem now because Jesus raises a man from the dead. Lazarus and everybody knew he was dead he'd been dead four days there's no accident here it's not like oh we made a mistake he's been dead for four days so they said what are we going to do now <laughs> this man keeps on doing these things in the message it says he keeps creating God signs <laughs> look at the person next to you say you are a God sign <laughs> and you should be more neon and poof, poof. God loves you. God loves you. It's okay if you made a mistake. He'll forgive you. Just allow him into your life. That's Eugene Peterson. This man keeps on doing these things, creating God signs. If we let him go on pretty soon, everyone will be believing in him. <laughs> yeah, that's right. He's God. That's what you want. You know, you're supposed to be in the family business here of connecting people to God. These are the Pharisees that are saying this. But then the Romans will come and remove the little power and privilege that we still have. So instead of bowing our knee to him, let's kill him. And one of them, Caiaphas, the designated chief priest that year, spoke up and said, you don't know anything, or don't you know anything? Can't you see that it's to our, our advantage that one man dies for the people rather than the whole nation be destroyed? Isn't that ironic? Oh my God, he has no idea what he's saying, but he's speaking the gospel right there. It's to our advantage if we try to kill him. That's what the devil, that, he always overplays his hand. The very thing, thing that he thinks is going to accomplish his goal defeats his goal because he gets too caught up. Somebody was asking me if I ever studied about quail, and it's interesting because that one portion of Scripture in the Old Testament that says when God gave them all the quail, that they were just scourging themselves. Remember, remember this scene? It's a very graphic scene. They're gorging themselves on quail, and it says that God struck them dead right in the middle of that spirit of gluttony that had come on them. That's what the devil does. He overplays his hand. See, so now Caiaphas is like, don't you get it? The real best plan here is to take out one man to preserve everybody else. David and Goliath, same thing. You got the whole army here, but one person comes and represents this army and one represents the other. Jesus represents us to the Father. All our sins covered under the blood. Once for all. Not bulls every year, not lambs every year. Once for all, prior and future. Oh boy, thank you, Lord. Firstborn over all creation. And John is telling, uh, in, in in the message version, John speaking, is saying that Caiaphas didn't do this of, of his own accord, but he did it as a chief priest. 
that year, unwittingly, he was prophesying that Jesus was about to die sacrificially for the whole nation. And not only for the nation of Israel, but so that all God's exile scattered children. Any of you out here now? Are you a, a God exile scattered yeah. children? Yes. Where were we? We were so far away from each other. I doubt we would have all met each other other than Jesus, right? But what a beautiful conglomeration that he put together of a family gathered into one people. From that day on, they plotted to kill Jesus. So this is just a week before he dies. Within a week, he would be dead. And it's all because he already raised somebody from the dead. But it's also so that his apostles that were with him could reflect back on this after the resurrection and say, ah, oh, Lazarus was just a foreshadowing of what Jesus was showing us. Because if you look, he talks all throughout the Gospels that after three days he would rise from the dead, that he would be persecuted. But they didn't get it, and I can understand why. It's not easy. So I'm almost done. Say amen. <laughs> so I can't stop without the third version of Mary at the feet of Jesus because we could easily miss this uh, as a valuable thing. I'm a financial person, read it, studied, and got an economics degree, and then I got an MBA in finance, and then I went to work in that industry in New York City, and it's very cutthroat. And they'll say time is money, right? And that's a true, that's a true statement. But God time is worth a lot of money, man. Let me tell you, you spend time with God, you're going to do a lot better with your decision making, and that's called prayer. But in the rational mind, praying when you have a big list of things to do doesn't is not coherent until you realize how much better God is at managing your schedule and helping you to know where to say no right. <laughs> and what to focus on and just develop that maturity and that trust in God that he will show you. He loves you. He'll show you exactly how you should handle the situation. All right, so in John 12, Mary picked up an alabaster jar filled with nearly a, a liter of extremely rare and costly perfume, the purest extract of the nard, I'm sorry, of nard, and she anointed the feet of Jesus. Can we just stand right now, and can we just hold up something valuable to the Lord in, in your imagination, something that you really value? I know she was on her knees when she did this, but I, I just want us to understand the, the image of extravagant love and extravagant worship that Mary was showing right now. She was so grateful that her brother was risen from the dead, and yet she must have had a revelation that, he was all, that Jesus was going to be dying soon, right? Because he says, she's doing this in preparation for my burial. And yet, she brings this expensive jar, something that she really valued, that represents the anointing of God. And she pours it out on his feet. Oh, the purest extract of nard, and she anointed Jesus' feet. And then she wiped them dry with her long hair. And the fragrance of the costly oil filled the house. And Judas will always say, what a waste. But if you experience anything this morning during worship, you know what we're talking about, right? Like there settles in a presence of the Lord that helps reset your compass to true north. It's like, oh yeah, I was so messed up and confused. And then I came into the sanctuary and there was an alignment between heaven and earth and I re-locked into your zone, Lord. And now I have a greater immune system to, to the sin that's trying to hold me back and stop me or, or derail me. Or even a sense of vengeance that I might have harboring in my heart that I have to get back at somebody. And the Lord's like, no, let me do it. Vengeance is mine. You don't have to take that one into your own hands. And, she wipes them dry with her long hair, right? Another deep study that you could do, but I, I like the one that I read that said when, when she did that, she kept the fragrance of the oil with her even after she left because her hair retained the fragrance. Yeah. And the, our worship is often compared to incense burning, right, before the Lord. But there'll always be somebody to tell you, you're a fanatic. You're spending too much time studying and reading the Bible. How many times do you have to read that book? Except when Trisha was in a bad mood, her mother would go to Anna, her sister, and say, tell your sister she should read that book. Because <laughs> her mother knew that when Trisha was in the Word, it was the good twin. <laughs> so 
Oh, I love this. This is it. This is the last verse. It says in verse 7, Jesus said to Judas, leave her alone. She has saved it for the time of my burial. So she, I mean, this is just three chapters. So she's, she's at his feet in the living room in John 10. She's at his feet in tears in John 11 because Lazarus died. She, she sees the resurrected Lazarus like, oh my God, talk about blow your mind with a miracle. Her brother comes out of the tomb. And now she's in John chapter 12. First verses of John 12 is she's thanking him. She's coming to him and saying, this thing that I hold so valuable, it's called the year's worth of wages in scripture, right? This is no small prize she's bringing him, which I would say is our worship. It's the most precious thing. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be also. So you're going to worship the thing that you love the most, which means you're going to put as much time into the thing that you love the most. Right. Right? So help us, Lord. Just help us reset our priorities. We ask you, we want, we want to be more like Mary than Martha, and we're not condemning Martha. We understand there's things that have to get done, but, but there's so much better done after we hear your instructions first. So we just pray you declutter our minds from whatever's trying to hijack us with fear or whatever whatever tool the enemy's using. We ask you to dismantle his arsenal that he's using against us. Remove the weapons that are causing confusion in our lives so that we could just fall down on our knees before you. Open up that valuable incense and pour it out upon you. And then recognize the anointing with us as we flow through the day. That you'll guide us and, and that our ears will be open. You said that my sheep hear my voice and they know my voice and the voice of a stranger, they will not follow. So we just say, Lord, we're sorry if we put anything else in front of you. We just ask you to help us remove it right now. Open our eyes to see what's been distracting us and help us zone in and focus in on, on what you say is the most important thing. Because then he says to Judas now, remember, wow, this really hit me too. He says to Judas, you, Judas, will always have the poor with you because you're stealing the money. But you, Judas, won't always have me. <laughs> How many of you still have Jesus? Oh, yeah. I have him. I hope you have him. Yeah. So maybe, I don't know, that's another day we'll dig more into that one, that uh, it's that thief. He was called a locksmith. Judas is called a locksmith. You look in that. Passion Translation, he knew how to pick locks. He's a thief. And you have to know that Jesus would have known that, right? Like he's got him on his team because Jesus even washed Judas' feet in the upper room. Greater love, oh my God, greater love has no man than this. So Lord, as we focus in on the crucifixion and the resurrection this week, we ask you to help us just steep ourselves in the word of God to just recognize that the things of the world grow strangely dim in the light of your glory, in the light of your grace, in the light of your love for us. When we come into contact with people who are hijacked emotionally, we don't want to pile on top of them, Lord. We want to hear the voice of the Lord in every situation that you, when we open our mouth, you'd be speaking through us that truth spoken in love that will just penetrate their hearts and be like packets of love penetrating their hearts. And if you don't know the Lord, if you've never said yes to Jesus, if you've never invited him into your heart, there's no better time than right now. And if I talk to you tomorrow, I'd say the same thing. There's no better time than right now because there's plenty of things trying to get you away from thinking about him. But we're telling you it's the best decision that you could ever make. Somebody please make noise right now. It's the best decision that you could ever make. So whether you're here and, and you're in the room and you don't know Jesus and you just have to take another step and say, yes, I'm going to choose to make him my Lord. My wife and I didn't know each other when we got saved, but we both said the same thing. What do I have to lose? My life is not going real well with me at the wheel. So I'm going to let him have a turn at the wheel. It can't get any worse than what it is right now. But maybe you're not in that place. It doesn't matter. You'll still completely benefit from knowing Jesus as your Lord and Savior. There's no better relationship that you'll ever have in your life than a love relationship. Not a distant one, but a right up front. He's a very present help in time of trouble. So Lord, we just pray for anyone watching or anyone here today that doesn't know you, that they would open up 
their heart to you, that they would hear you knocking on the door of their heart, and they would say yes to the invitation that you're asking them to connect with you and make you Lord. So just say this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of your Son, Jesus. I heard today that it's by his blood took the punishment for the sin that I made. And I'm not punished when I come in underneath that blood. I turn from my wicked ways. I repent from my sin. And I ask you to fill me with your power, the truth of your word, and the power of your spirit to fill me and empower me to serve you. Holy servanthood. In a holy way, but also holy, completely, my whole life, to be in servitude to you for the rest of this life, Lord, and for eternity. Amen. Amen. So if you said that prayer, and you're not here in the room, you can call us, you can contact us, it's easy to find us. If you are here in this room, we would just ask you to take a bold step of faith. This is an altar, okay? It's not a stage, it's an altar. And what you do on altars is you bring things to God that are valuable to you. You can bring your life to God on this altar and say, you know what, I tried it my way, didn't work out so good. I know now that I need you, Lord, so I'm bringing you my life right now, and I'm gonna offer you this holy thing, because you're made in his image, and he wants you here at this altar. If you said yes to the Lord, no embarrassment, no shame, just come up here and kneel at this altar, and we would love to pray with you and introduce you to this amazing Jesus. Greater love has no man than this, to let you know that he laid down his life for you. Amen? Amen. Start bringing some unbelievers, church. They need to get saved. <laughs> I just want to bless you guys. If, uh, if nobody's coming up to the altar, we will have prayer. So there's prayer teams that will be here. So come forward if you need prayer. Just come up that aisle right there, and the ushers will, will assign you. Sorry I ran a little long today, guys, but forgive me. You have to. You're Christians. You have to forgive me. <laughs> so, Lord, I just bless your people. This is such an awesome week to be a Christian, to move from that ride into town to the, through the crucifixion and then through the resurrection next Sunday. Lord, help us to focus in on you and be wholly committed and wholeheartedly sold out to you in everything that we do. I pray you bless your children as they go and that each of us would know that our assignment is clear in your eyes. We want it to be clear in our eyes how you want to live each minute of, how you want us to live each minute of every day in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you all. Have an awesome week. Resurrection Sunday, next up.